Welcome to the Tuck Shop Podcast. I'm Matt Cernell, recording live here on the University of Pittsburgh Johnstown campus. Happen to be here today. As always, I am joined by David Janicek. David? Hello. Happy Hello. cold morning to you. Hello, Matt. I have a theory that uh, Johnstown weather or Richland weather, that it's constantly 90 degrees all year round. It's the wind chill. Oh. It regulates the 60s, the 50s, the 12s. I think we had a 7 this we had a seven this morning. But, boy, I tell you what, graduating uh, in the 80s, these are the winners I remember. So coming back, it's kind of like a homecoming when you feel your eyeballs freeze. It reminds you when you went here in the 80s when it was like this a lot. There were no mild winners back then, no. so to speak. But, uh, again, always happy to be here. Just wanted to, I guess, jump in a little bit before we get to our guest. Talk about, uh, I'm going to sort of sort of sound like a broken record on some of the things we've talked about, but I do want to remind everyone, um, speaking of the weather, uh, this uh, sa- Friday and Saturday is our Winter Fest, our annual Winter Fest. Um, Friday night uh, starts at 7 with Wrestling at Seton Hill, and then um, alumni uh, athletic uh, guest reception afterwards, cocktails, hors d'oeuvres, that sort of thing. Friday, or excuse me, Saturday is, uh, is a, a kind of a extenuation from last year because we've added the bonfire uh, man i thought last saturday would have been a perfect bonfire day it was a cold Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been great but next saturday i think it's supposed to still be in the 30s and 40s so we're going to do a bonfire after uh after the women get done uh beating up on gannon uh they do a one and a three o'clock game uh men's play at three after that game we're going to do uh, the bonfire with uh, barbecue and uh and brews so if you're inclined to um, imbibe in a, in a cocktail or two. We'll have those available. Um, Friday night is a $10 fee. Saturday is a $10 fee. Friday night you get a nice uh, nice retro throwback uh, T-shirt. Saturday we're giving you a hat to keep your head warm. Um, but the big important thing is make sure that you go on and register so we make sure we have enough uh, food and beverage. And that's at uh, uh, www.thenumber4.upj.pit.edu forward slash alumni. I know I said before that's a very long uh, address, but if you go on to uh, the athletic website, the, uh, the Alumni Association uh, Facebook page, it's all right there. Two other quick things I do want to talk about. Um, also, we're in the middle of our Mountain Cat Couples activities. So if, uh, you know, we talked last week, if you met your significant other and you're still together, we'd like to hear about it. Uh, so we're asking send a picture, send a message, or send send your story. Include uh, kind of things like where you met, uh, what your story, you know, how you met. Um, if you're married, involve uh, if you're married or involved and you still have a maiden name, uh, please put your maiden name, graduation years. You can send those to DGJ the number seven at uh, pit.edu. Last thing I want to talk about, and then I'm going to be off. This is a new thing. Um, March 23rd, the week of March 23rd, we are planning uh, the 50th, uh, 50th year celebration of our engineering and um, computer science uh, programs. So starting on March 23rd, we're going to do a uh, picnic. Uh, it's going to be indoors, more than likely, uh, indoor-outdoor type picnic, have tours going on on that Saturday. We're also planning on doing things throughout the week. That is Eng- Engineers Week, uh, particularly this year. So uh, if you're an alum, watch for an invitation coming out soon. The other thing we'd like to see is, um, I know our guest was an engineer. Yes. Um, don't know that they had Engineering Week back when he was here. but We did. We did. So Engineering Week this year, we want to invite alumni back to partake in Engineering Week. So, uh, again, keep an eye out on our Facebook page, web page. We'll be sending out invitations. Uh, we'd love to see a lot of engineers come back. And uh, it's kind of interesting, I think, with engineers. They're kind of like, here's how we do it now. And I, you always love to hear that. Well, here's how we did it, uh, sort of thing. With a slide rule. <laughs> with a, so one maybe we'll have a slide rule competition. One thing, too, about about with the invitations is if you aren't 100% sure, you might get one in the mail or the email. Probably means you haven't talked to us or heard from us lately. Right. Your information could be not updated, right? That so you can go to the upj.pit.edu slash alumni site and make sure you're updated. Your information you know, may have moved in the last couple of years or something and just... In the, in the hustle and bustle of moving a household, forgot to update us, and you're not seeing emails or, or, or um, getting mailers in the mail from the institutional advancement. So something there, to if, you, if you're like, oh, I want to make sure I hear about that, make sure your information is updated as well. So keep an eye out. We'll also be doing, we'll be using our LinkedIn page a lot. 
So if you're a LinkedIn member to our page, uh, we'll be putting out invitations, information um, about uh, the big engineering, and we're including computer science, which is now a part of that department, um, for that uh, week of March 23rd, planning a lot of festivities uh, around Engineers Week, and we'd love to see alumni come back. Even if it's during the day, even if you come up during your lunch hour, um, to take in, you know, uh, some of the activities or in the evenings. So keep uh, ears open and eyes open for that information. Great. Thank you, David, for, as always, coming and giving us an update on things that are happening in your world. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, moving on to our guest. I've been so excited about the way getting this interview scheduled in. Don Freeburn, thank you for coming. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. What's your pitch Johnstown story? What's your UPJ story? How did you start here? How did I start? Well, not here, okay? It's back when it's the old asphalt campus. And uh, actually, uh, my, my twin brother and I uh, attended early. We were still in high school, completing the last year in high school at Johnson High. And my father talked, I guess, with the uh, Pitt Chancellor at that time, Johnson Chancellor. And they had a program, I guess, uh, identified for early uh, entry. I think there was about five or six, I guess, students, two women, and my brother and I, and uh, I think there was a Air Force person, too, coming in back to school and stuff like that mm -hmm. was available. And so we came in, I guess it was April, I guess, when the trimester system started. We were still in high school, and every teacher that we had, except one, the English teacher, said, hey, you're finished, don't have to come back to any more classes, you're, you're done, you got a good grade and everything else, don't have to come back. But the English teacher, uh, Miss Barner, and everybody knew her for hundreds of years, okay? <laughs> I had older sisters and stepbrothers and stuff like that who had her and that, and every time he went to her class, she said, oh, another free burn. But she went back even more than that. But she was notoriously, but notoriously good, though, very mm -hmm. good English teacher, and of course, my brother and I were both in the honors level of academic at Johnstown, so we were in there with all the rest of the bright students, particularly English class of the women. They could gabble, 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 not without no notes or anything else like that, whereas I would be back there saying, hope the period ends before I could give my speech. And, uh, but that summer we came and uh, went for the first, we had no engineering classes, we couldn't start anything until the fall. So we had all the tough teachers in the social classes, Miss Reiser, Dr. Reiser, I guess, uh, Dr. Sheep, and uh, who else? Uh, oh, the great one was Mr. Crow. He worked at the uh, newspaper, but he was teaching speech. Mm. And you gave a speech every class. Every, every class you had a speech, five-minute speech, two-minute speech. You had to prepare them, different subjects. He didn't want to hear the same thing over and over again from all the students. So uh, you had to do a little investigations and everything else like that. But trying to give them every day, every period, that got you out of the willies and that. Even though you're in a brand-new class with everybody else, you just got up and gave them. And by the time you're finished with the class, you, you're an okay speaker, didn't worry too much, knew you had to prepare, but it was great. Uh, Dr. Reiser, she was trying to teach us how to think for ourselves. And I, I said, I guess, in my little article back to the alumni request, what has been done for you, yeah. I said, she's the first one that I had as a professor or a teacher that really says, hey, I want you to start thinking. Just don't look at the book and memorize. I want you to think about one step further. And uh, I'm going be, to be quizzing you on those things. And she did. And we failed. My, my brother and I both failed. Mm -hmm. We both came back, okay, in a special class. And she says, okay, now I told you in class, but this is what I really meant. And uh, it took a while, but... Uh, we finally, you know, we're really taught, okay, hey, start thinking about what you're reading in that. Not just what was in the book, but do some reasoning in your mind. There's pros and cons and everything else, and you have to know some of those, not just what's in the book. But uh, like I said, that first term during the summertime was really tough. We also had to take algebra. Mm -hmm. And I was acing the course and then got sick the last week 
and failed the final. Oh. I know the professor said, Don, what happened to you? I said, I was sick. But uh, I had aced algebra all through high school and everything else, but uh, I, I was so sick and everything else. But made it through that, and then the next fall, got right into engineering with two of the greatest professors that I ever had, Dr. Saylor and George Peck. Between the two of them, they taught us, taught us all our engineering courses in uh, Pitt Johnstown. And once we got to main campus, as I mentioned, too, in my little article, that uh, we were ready. We were ready up to, up to snuff for the rest of the uh, professors down at the main campus and that. We didn't have to drop back and have more studies or anything else. We were ready for it. What drew you to engineering? Engineering, engineering. A couple different things I think I identified. Uh, science fiction was get, uh, taking hold in the 50s. Some movies and everything else like that on TV, and uh, TV had also the, uh, I guess, the Victory at Sea program. Uh, black and white, all the war films from Germany and particularly the Pacific where they had the aircraft carriers. Mm -hmm. And all those aircraft looked just fantastic to me. And uh, I didn't want to fly because I got car sick. Okay, I knew I'd get air sick whenever I flew, okay? And sure enough, I did when first time I ever flew. But, uh, but no, I, I liked uh, the, you know, very progressive, you know, designs and things like that. And said, hey, that's fantastic. And I had an aeronautical teacher in high school. We had aeronautics, and he was a P-51, which was one of the great, you know, uh, aircrafts, you know, fighter aircrafts in the, in the Second World War in Germany particularly. And uh, he was of the Mennonite faith, and essentially he would not talk about his service in that because that was against his faith. He had gone against his family in that. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I knew he was an ace. We found out, you know, that he had been an ace and everything else like that. But he taught a very good course in aeronautics in that. And uh, at that time, that was what I really wanted to do. I said it in fifth grade the first time when the teacher says, what do you want to do in your life? And everybody's saying all the, I guess the women are saying, just like my high school yearbooks, uh, they're either going to be a nurse or they're going to be a secretary. And some are going to be key punchers by that time, too. But uh, then all the men were there saying, well, I'm going to be a laborer. I'm going to be in a steel mill and things like that. <laughs> and my... My course back there in, I guess, fifth grade, I guess some of the guys wanted to be scientists. I, my brother and I both wanted to be engineers. He, he said chemical engineer. Mm. But I was there with the aircraft and that. I said aeronautical engineering. So later on I became an aerospace engineer. But sure. I really had aeronautical engineering throughout the whole coursework and I had. So, so what did I end up doing? flying some vehicles that had no air around them. Vacuum of space. <laughs> well, I was going to get to that. Why don't, okay. we, why don't we then explain to the folks who haven't had the pleasure of eating, having a lunch with you like I have, where, what did you do with your engineering degree that people may have heard about? Well, what did I do, or how did I get there first? Let's, let's say where you went, where where I went. You, and then how did you get there? Okay. okay. Uh, first job was with uh, NASA Houston uh, this was January. I got a telegram saying, are you available? I said, definitely yes. And within a month, I was hired in in February of 1965. And that was a big time at that, that spot because they were ramping up with hirings. And uh, I went to NASA, and I was uh, into a division of propulsion and power, which includes everything on the Apollo spacecrafts both the uh, lunar modules, the two vehicles, the upper stage, the lower stage, and also the service propulsion system, which was a vehicle that essentially boosted them mid-course corrections to the moon, braked them going into orbit, took them back out of orbit, back to the Earth, and any other mid-course corrections. Of course, the lunar modules had took them down to the surface, and the other top part of it took them up, back to rendezvous with the service propulsion system and bring them back home. 
So my office had responsibility for all of those three propulsion systems, very similar systems, but to me they weren't because I never had rocket engineering at Pitt. I had aviation in that, aircraft, boundary flow, et cetera, but not a spacecraft flying in the vacuum of space or landing in the vacuum of space. Wasn't an optional on the class you could take in it how to get not to the moon? In, no, not, it was an, not like on an elective. The, no, not on the agenda. <laughs> What, so how did you, like you were kind of alluding to, how did you eventually, how did you find that opportunity? How did I find that how, opportunity? Yeah, how did you, how did you uh, what it, led you to get that telegram? It was uh, basically the counselor at Pitt. It was, uh, we, he was the one responsible for bringing everyone in to interview for jobs. And at that time, it was the Cold War. That was really the Cold War, okay? And so there was a lot of defense jobs. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and, and NASA got started in 58, and they were trying to figure out where they were going to. They are supposed to be told in 62 by Kennedy, you're going to get to the moon before the end of the decade and come back safely with some rocks, hopefully. <laughs> and, uh, but again, he says, hey, you'll get there by 1969, which we did twice, actually, mm -hmm. before the end of 69. But... Uh, to answer the question, how did I get the job? I interviewed every major aerospace company because they had a good job of bringing in the representatives and had interviews. And we had a tough time with classes and everything else trying to stage them around our classes and that. Uh, so I interviewed uh, probably over 20 different companies that had come in, but the major ones, Boeing and McDonald, everybody. And... I started, that was really the last term in uh, September, uh, October, November, and then came December, and I was getting letters back saying, thank you for the interview. Uh, we're going to put your letter in file in case we need it. And we knew what that file was. That was a round file. Yeah. And uh, uh, other, other firms didn't even send me a letter back. I went to the counselor towards, I guess it started December, and he said, Don, you should have told me you're a diabetic. Why didn't you, okay? Because they're not going to hire you. You're a di type 1 diabetic. I learned that in my first year of college in 62. I'm on insulin. They said, they think you're going to die within the first couple of years, so they're not going to pick you up. He said, I recommend that you try to apply for a government job. I have a two-inch here booklet you can take that back with you here's some six page forms you can use the typewriter you know how to use a typewriter don't you yes right <laughs> i did because i had a class when it was in seventh grade and that i had a class that my my dad sent us to which was the greatest thing we had back then because my grades in english and other re reports and that were probably one grade higher because a teacher could read and that and I had to read it, too, to make sure I didn't make any mistakes. So it was really proof-checking. But uh, sent out all the uh, forms within the first couple of weeks, or the last couple of weeks of December. And the first week in January, I received a telegram at home saying, are you available? And sure enough, they had a program that Kennedy had sponsored, John Kennedy, trying to hire the handicap in the government as a model for industry. And it was a different type of program at that time than today because it had actually uh, today's program is goals. If you don't make your goal, well, y'all yeah, do better next year. They had actual quotas. Mm -hmm. They had two lists, one the regular list, the other the handicap list. And the supervisor didn't know whether or not if he was going to hire from one or the other until they said you have to take it from the other list, the, the disability list. And that's what I got. I got. My name came up, and they chose me out of the, the packages that were there. But, again, this was a high time of hiring that because they needed people in sure. the aerospace industry. So you're sitting in Texas working on this program. Learning the whole program, okay? I went in there, didn't know anything about Apollo. I didn't know where Houston was. <laughs> I knew it was in Texas because I rooted for the Houston Texans, okay, or okay. Houston Oilers, I guess, back yeah. then. But I didn't know if it was going to be on the coast, inland, or what, okay? And Texas is a big place. Yes. And uh, the first plane flight out of Pittsburgh down to Houston, and uh, 
you know, I got sick. I knew I was going to get sick. I had drama me, but I still got sick. And uh, but I got there, and the uh, first thing was here your big big room, probably about the twice of your room right here, with about eight engineers and a desk, a desk, a desk. No computers. We all had our slide rules on our desks. All right, because that's the thing we used to calculate anything. The big problem was that they didn't have enough mimeograph machines, enough copiers in that, because everyone wanted, wanted data, and you needed to have data to understand things. Sure. So uh, I know that was a, a big problem. You couldn't think things home. Things were classified. And so you had to stay in your office and everything and read and then lock them up, too. And they had guards roaming out, okay? You didn't take anything they had classified. You left your safe open, they come, came after you, and you came right back in. Was After the initial hiring process, where were the first couple of, you know, hey, new job the kind of stuff? The first couple of months was learning. You went to classes about the, the spacecraft themselves. Yeah and uh, then learned about the system, the management, and everything else. And this was a very big hierarchical thing, okay, management. And also different compartments and everything else, who you shouldn't talk to. There was a little bit about, it was almost like the military. You don't talk to these people because they're above your grade. Don't talk about this, which was terrible for communications then. Yeah. And, uh, but again, most of the time was learning, okay, they didn't want you to be working on anything, okay, that they weren't going to approve by two or three layers. What was that? Did And I guess my question kind of goes along the lines of, is during that time, during those first, those, those initial years, was there a sense that it was going to be such a historical point, not just for aeronautic and, 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 and space, but also just for the planet as a whole? Or was it? Like anything else, it just becomes a job. It became. Where it really became a job. It just okay, like, to me, oh, it's Thursday, I, I, man. I can't I wait till Friday. I thought back on that too. You know, when I was writing that one article, and no, we were here. We were, we knew what the mission was: get there by the end of the decade. And uh, but how? Uh, I wasn't privy to all the big schedules. They were about three layers up for me in another office, and that where you had all the schedules for all systems and everything else that had to work together, not only at Johnson Spacecraft Center, but Marshall had the assignment of uh, the big booster, the Saturn boosters, mm -hmm. and that, two or three of them there. And uh, so, you know, you didn't get the big picture. Again, there was a lack of data. We didn't have faxes. Nobody had faxes, okay, at the time, but then they later got those. Copiers and that, you couldn't use unless you had a, you know, a reason for that. So it's really hard to see the whole picture and everything else as a person my level on that, entry level. I had a number of other people in the office who already had uh, 10, maybe 15 years experience with the Army, Navy, and stuff like that where they pulled them out first as engineers and that. So they had run through some of these programs, running through with the contractors, schedules, and everything else like that. Of course, the contractors are off-site, and you had to go out to California or down to the Cape or up to New York, Bethpage, Grumman, where they were building the, the spacecraft. First year, you didn't get to go anywhere, all right? So you didn't learn. You didn't talk to contractors unless they came by, and usually you weren't the one talking to them. So the first one was just learning the whole system. What was – you've talked about education even beyond just learning the system. What was What was – through the years, because how long did you end up then working for NASA? I worked uh, 13 years for NASA, uh, Apollo program, the Apollo Skylab program, three missions there with the Apollo S Service Propulsion System, uh, the one mission with the Soviets, joining up with the Soviet vehicle, shaking hands, going back, yeah. <laughs> and uh, then the last one was uh, with the space shuttle, and I left before the uh, two years before the space shuttle flew the first time. But I got there to work the, the early elementary level designs of the space shuttle, and they had all kind of configurations, thinking they had all the money in the world. But uh, they finally found out that nobody cared after we went to the moon a couple times. The budgets just started decreasing. And uh, I saw, well, time to move on, next thing. 
because I was into the program. I saw the new development and everything else up to the point before they flew. So I had been through one cycle already, mm -hmm. contractor-wise, everything else like that. And my wife wanted to come back. She's from Patton, where we live now, and wanted to come back closer to the families up here, my family and her family. And uh, it took me a number of years. Again, uh, money got out of different programs and the only person that uh, only program that really started was the energy program, and that was in uh, about seventy eight time frame. What can, what did you can do with continuing education as far as an engineering perspective? Like what did they I have tried to go back for a master's with uh, when I was going to school there. I mean, going to work and uh, I went to the University of Houston and that and. Uh, Learned that my algebra skills and my trigonometry skills, all those things met their match for this abstract math, okay, that was taught, okay. It's to me, it's still abstract, okay. And uh, between that, I started to go on the road to travel to contractors and that, and to try to do studies and everything else. You couldn't come back for class, everything else like that. It just didn't match up. And I said, okay. And most of the people that were uh, engineers, I only knew of one or two doctors, okay? Mm -hmm. The others were few masters, but the rest of them are just your basic uh, bachelor's degrees and that, and a lot of experience. I guess the experience, because really when you do think about it, uh, what again, what class are you going to go to that helps you? I, we still don't offer a class here on, in the curriculum that is very vast here at UPJ, but doesn't include anything. How the do you land individuals on the moon? who had <laughs> co-op, though, came in and co-op in our office, and that went yeah. back to school f for a term or two and then came back in for another co-op session. And that, I think, they had the good practical experience, and that's the way for that type of program and everything else. If you get some practical experience, what are they really doing out there? and go back and do your studies and everything else and learn how it's applied and that and uh, come back again back and forth. It took them a year longer, two years longer than that to do their, get their uh, degrees in that, but they were more rounded, okay? Okay, you know, and they'd already started, so they, were, they moved up faster. That's one of the questions I like asking when we do these interviews is, is if you could go down now and grab a, a group of students someplace and tell them, this is the thing that would be a different... At least is one that term, what you, if not two, at least two terms or something like that with an industry. Do a variety of industries or something like that and understand, you know, where is it going to be, you know, used? Because mm -hmm. most of the stuff you learn, you don't use. And then you have to, you know, learn by practical experience or go, like, review, you know, science, science and everything. One thing, I didn't have enough science, okay? I realized that. You know, about the second or third year, you know, and everybody was talking about uh, this and that material and that kind of stuff. And I had one material, mesological course. It didn't really apply to the stuff that I was doing, so. Makes sense. The, um, did, did you ever lose that interest in the space program? You talked about what you decided to move on from a family standpoint. I lost you, it because it wasn't my, because when you went, I went to energy department at Morgantown. It was clean coal program just okay. started because of the energy crunch, the gas lines, and we we're trying to figure out various ways of getting ind independence and energy. Again, we didn't have the solar, solar it was very high priced. Wind energy wasn't up and running. Uh, nuclear was running along there. That's okay. Fossil energy, putting out a lot of gas, which they could do, okay, because mm -hmm. there was no climate warning or anything else like that. Uh, natural gas was, uh, no, you couldn't drill anymore because we didn't think we had enough. We didn't have the techniques to do that yet, fracturing, fract fracturing and uh, horizontal pipes and something like that, mining. And uh, so it, we really had an energy crunch. It was oil and uh, coal. So big program on coal. Change coal into liquids, okay, gas and fuels. Yeah. And the center director told me at uh, Morgantown, he said, I didn't pick you because you knew anything about coal. You came from the space department, okay? But you know contracting. And we had $2 million last year, and this year we're going to have – $200 million come in the door, and we got to get it out on time. So that's why I picked you, because you had contracting skills with the government. 
So uh, I didn't get hired because engineering skills, space skills, but basically because I knew contracting. The next job, six years later, I got hired because I knew fossil energy, being six years into fossil energy with, you know, so those are kind of, you know, unique things you say, look back on and say, well, as an engineer, how did I get hired? You know, I sent out a number of, you know, interviews for interviews and everything else, but. Kind of can see how they string together. They weren't the thing. They weren't the thing. So. Yeah. When, um. What is your when you see the stuff that occurs today with because I think and I, I as a space fan myself um, seeing that that downturn when you talk right. about the money getting pulled out it and and when this, I remember the day they said that we're not going to do space shuttle anymore and it's like right what we do seem now to see this reassur- uh, resurgence of interest in space. There it has been way. for a couple of years uh, because they promoted the Artemis program, the next coming back to the moon, okay, mm-hmm. with astronauts. And they're faltering right now. They just pushed the schedules back one they more year. You? One more Did year. Did they give you a call yet? No, 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 no. no. I don't want to go in there, okay? No. <laughs> they have to solve the program. They'll have problems there, okay? Mm-hmm. And the pro- big problem is money. And uh, because we're in a budget crunch now with, uh, you saw Congress and that, they can't even decide on, la- this year's budget was supposed to be done back in October. Mm-hmm. And we're skipping it one, one month to the next, okay? But uh, that's the kind of thing you get uh, w- be very wary of because even when I worked for Morgantown, uh, we had a change in administrations and Reagan came in and he said, no more coal, we're just gonna drill. Drill, drill, drill. And he said, no more coal. Senator Byrd from West Virginia said, mm-hmm. I'm appropriations chair, and I t- t- tell you what to do. We're going to have a half a billion dollar budget for coal. And uh, he won out. But uh, Reagan won out in the headquarters offices because he had a rift going on in fossil energy for administrative and that. But Senator DeBird, he he knew how to run the program and stuff like that. So I said, you got a you got a floor here in your building there. You're not going to go hiring below that, okay? So I was in, and stayed in there for six years until things started getting free again in the budgets. And energy was, hey, we're going to pursue all these types of energy. Do you have optimism about what they're doing, even with oh, the budget it, problems and so forth, with what we see with Artemis, what we I see with SpaceX? I have some pessimism what, on the side of why do we do human flight, okay? okay, when the objectives there are saying that we can go to the moon and get what resource? Everybody says, oh, well, there's ice there, which we can break down into water, into hydrogen for fuel, and we can use it other ways, too. And I said, so what? Is there a element there that we can use in photovoltaics or something, some mineral or something like that. Even that would be costly to get. These, these boosters in, uh, are now costing over $100 million, if not more than that, just to fly a unmanned vehicle to the moon. And what are we doing that for? It's really for the science. You do the science first, and maybe you do a little bit of the astronauts too, because again, you've got to Understand our bodies in space. We already know from a year-long stay on our space station and that there's problems out there with the physiology of the body and that. And then we're talking about going to Mars for a three-year trip. No way does the science say we support that in yet. We have to have a space station, which we have now, but that's going to age and be taken out of commission in 10 years, and they have to put a new station up there too. Because you have to have a flying platform in space to understand what it does to the body long term. Because if we're talking long term, stay on the moon or any place else, you have to know our physiology better. And particularly for both men and women and the various, various nationalities and everything else like that. We have to know much more, which means a lot longer program for science in a laboratory around the world around the u.s i mean around the world that's what it's always seemed to me is is when they explain that hey we got to get we're gonna get to the moon and then that's our launching point off to get to mars that is a big jump between getting to the that moon. is because they're talking about putting storage tanks for propellants and etc 
I know SpaceX, they're the one that's going to have a couple starships, which they've almost completed a good mission. The first two missions failed, okay, but they would say, yes, we learned a lot. All right. Well, they didn't learn a lot yet, okay? Mm-hmm. They've got a couple more failures, and they're pushing that. I love they call them rapid <laughs> uh, runs, rapid. Right. They unex- blew up the pad the first yeah. time. Rapid and, unexpected disassembly. Right. right. <laughs> or something like we that. We learn a lot, <laughs> they said. The one thing there which, that uh, is unique to what I had, uh, weight was very critical, and we had hard wires and sensors, heavy sensors and that, compared to what we have today. And that was a lot of weight, and you got minimum sensors, Minimum data, and you really have to justify that on your missions and everything else like that. These days, you see the control rooms, nice colors and that, and big screens, everything else, and uh, all the data they have up there. Because, again, we're into the transistors and the microsensors, everything else like that these days and that. So they have plenty of the data to look at so I can understand where – Musk says, hey, yes, we learn a lot, okay? We wouldn't have learned a lot because we didn't have that many sensors. We had a failure one time, and we were waiting for a couple of days just to get our data back. And that to understand, well, where's the problem we had? What was it? And everybody's beating down your toes saying, what's your problem, okay? Tell us about it because we're on schedules in there. So it was quite a difference, okay? But I often think about that when I see these things and, and having, again, having sat with you and uh, before and talked a little bit while we had lunch that time, when I think about what you think when you see them doing a li- uh, launch uh, to fo- for our astronaut, and it's touch screens it's, in the cabin. and uh, It's and beautiful. Oh, yes, we had the black and white little CRTs, okay, with minimal data. And we had to wait on data return and that, mm-hmm. and they have instant, okay, and instant recording at their fingertips and everything else like that so it's very very interesting david do you have anything that yeah you covered a lot um but um, i've been i've been very excited for this yeah it's great you've covered a lot question Um, so i still want to say though we need to go to the moon i guess just to understand but going to mars and that it's decades out unless we find there's a reason to do it or something some scientific reason which we haven't yet life okay yeah but even that, that can be done remotely, okay, first, with fewer dollars, okay, which we're going to have, but fewer dollars because it's a tremendous cost. So here's my question. So question, you know, we had Coach Pacora on last week, and we talked about teams and talked about, you know, individuals mm-hmm. and teams. So I'm going to kind of wrap this into to last week. So you're part of the Apollo project. <laughs> you know, I – I'm, I'm sure you've gotten asked every time you say that, you know, what about Apollo 13? But my question is, so, you know, Matt had mentioned earlier that this was not just a, this was a big project. This was a worldwide recognized project. You know, Kennedy said in 10 years we're getting right. to the moon. Um, I come to work and try to get from one day to the next. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. what am I doing in 10 years? So I guess my question is, um, when that happened, both, and I'm going to be a kind of a two-part, so when that happened, you know, you had the highs and the lows. Uh, what kind of feeling whenever, you know, there's that day when we're finally on the moon? I mean, I know you're an engineer, you're a part of a team, but how, did, how does that well, relate? Well, we were kind of looking over our shoulders saying, what's next, okay? Is somebody going to start cutting us back? Because we knew, we, we were talking about it, saying public loses interest fast, and they did. Yeah. After the second one, it was... Okay, then we had 13 happen right. one more time, but it didn't come up to the thing, and everybody's saying, that. why are we doing that? And, of course, Congress is saying that too, okay, on budgets and everything mm-hmm. else like that. And what's your next program? And we really didn't have a next program, Skylab, okay, right. little bits. And this thing about a space shuttle wasn't even formulated and things like that. And uh, But... Uh, the Congress lost interest in that, and that's what happens. Administrations change. What's the priorities in that? But I, uh, but now, again, even with this lunar, they've had about four different starts under different administrations. Right. They call it a couple of things, okay? And it's who's going to get in back of it, and why are they in back of it, and for what reasons? And for me, it's not a solid reason right now. Mm-hmm. Yes, we'd like to go back. We'd love to have astronauts in space. And 
the number one thing is going to be in the next couple of years is we're competing with China because China is there. We had the Russians. Where at that time, it was a race. And we almost lost a race, okay, as far as bringing moon rocks back. That was going to be my question. They had brought back, they had sent a uh, robotic device and crashed a year before on the moon. And it was meant to bring back samples. And that would have brought back the first rocks and said, no, we lost that one, too. They brought the first rocks from the moon. And, uh, but as it turned out, no, we brought it back. Matter of fact, the same time we landed with Apollo 11, the first landing, they sent another one back, an, a robotic, and it also crashed. So, therefore, they didn't bring the moon rocks back first, okay? We did. So, then it says, okay, what's the, no, why are we going after more moon rocks for? We won that race. Yeah, I was going to kind of. And that's the only thing we won, okay? It's bringing back rocks, because <laughs> what else did we bring back? Nothing else. Yeah. We didn't find anything that said we should go back. Right. It did. It did seem, and David's question kind of made me think about that. Is that it would seem like the oddly enough that the biggest motivation to take the next step into a larger universe would be some type of foe trying to do it before the United States. Right. That's what the Chinese are doing, and they've let, and they again. It's a Cold War race again because they don't speak about their programs and that. We have to find out from our sensitive satellites and everything else like that, and. Uh, but uh, it's still a Cold War going on, and they have a space station with three astronauts up there right now, too, their own, and nobody else with them, all right? So they are in a race with us to go back to the moon. Me. But it's not mentioned, though. Yet nobody really mentions it right now. But in, but in your part that you played, the 13 years, do you ever, you know, what did you do today? Did you ever say, I put a, help put a man on the moon? Right. I was well. Again, I, I realized too, especially after the 50-year anniversary, all the public ca- publications came out and said we're going to do it another time, and uh, we haven't done it yet. And but the 50-year anniversary was there was a half a million people. Um, half a it's, no, it's a half a million people around the world supporting the Apollo program at the time of the first moon landing. That includes all the Navy people that are out there in the oceans picking up the the people in that, all the uh, telecom people around the world and the different stations we had around the world. And also, uh, it was everybody that made a little part on the one piece of the Apollo program, okay? There was, you know, half a million people that had touched something or did something. So I was one of half a million. <laughs> and right now, it's kind of like Tom Brokaw saying, we had that greatest generation in World War II and we're losing all of them. Well... That's a situation for the people who worked on Apollo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're losing because I have a lot of, a lot of uh, faxes, and not faxes, but emails and that up from Houston, my people I know down there saying this person died, yeah. that person died. I'm 80, going on 81. I'm as old as the president and still vigorous <laughs> like the president, but most of my age are not, okay? And many were older when I first came in there by 10, 15 years. Yeah. On to, so they're gone. So... Uh, I am still enthusiastic, though, okay? It's something we ought to be doing because we want to be doing. We can't just stay on this earth. That's, uh, that's a great sentiment. I had an alumni that used to, was on this show earlier, mostly because, you know, she lives with me, wanted me to ask you, if you were given the chance, they needed for some reason to come over, to, Don, we need you. Suit up. You're going. Would you have gone? No, I can't. I, I like I said, I got nauseous in the back seat of the okay. car. Okay, <laughs> and, and I got nauseous in the first plane flight, and I had Dramamine, and all Dramamine does is just slows you down and everything else right afterwards. Boy, it's not a pleasure. Okay, I would probably have loved it if I didn't have the nausea. Okay, would like to try to do that, mm-hmm. but motion sickness. No, I, I motion sickness stopped me. You know, even before I even went into aeronautics. Okay, so. I'm that way in elevators, too. So, <laughs> so no, but I, 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 I hear Musk out there saying, I'm going to be the first on Mars, even if I don't come back. Well, he has a billion, more than that, okay? He can do anything he wants to, and he probably will, so. As long as he doesn't get And first person sick. on Mars may be Musk, okay? It wouldn't be me, though. <laughs> 
thank you, Don, so much for coming and spending the better part of an hour with us, actually. Well, I enjoyed it. I, I want, you know, the point being made, Don, you make a good point that, you know, that generation's going to be gone at some point. And I think even this little bit of just coming and telling your story on the podcast helps, I would hope, helps to preserve that for our alum. Well, and I go around to the local libraries the last about five, six, seven years and two, and I got introduced there by a professor at uh, St. Francis, okay, she, up here at a potato fest. I, she had a booth, and I talked to her, and she said, hey, Don, you can make a presentation, okay? I have students in that. want to hear from you in that. It's coming on 50 years, and uh, it would be a nice thing to have. And uh, so I got into that, and I enjoyed the kids and everything else. And particularly in my day, you didn't see any women. You didn't see any uh, people of color or anything else, okay? It was all white male, okay, from, from the Army, Navy, Air Force, all that kind of thing, too. And we need to, you know, we're, we have a country, half women, and we're not going to use them? That's no sense at all. They have many ideas, different ideas, which are the strength of science, strength of math, and everything else like that, different ways to approach things. And to say, no, we're only going to use half of them, boy, we, I don't know how we might make it to the moon, okay? <laughs> but they were in the background. I mean, a lot of mathematicians on that, and you saw the one movie, too, yeah, for John Glenn figures, and that, yeah. and that. But they were in the background, okay? You can't do that. You have to have everybody participate, and I love the little girls and that asking their questions when I make these presentations <laughs> about Apollo and everything else like that. And I said, "Hey, you can be the first to be on Mars. Go it. after it." I said, "Don't let anybody stop you." It's fantastic. Good advice. Thanks again for coming, Don. Well, thanks for having it. me. Thank you, Don. The Tuck Shop podcast is recorded live on the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown campus. Update your contact information with us by visiting johnstown.pitt.edu slash alumni. Connect with us online via Facebook and LinkedIn. Or consider donating to the university at give to, that's G-I-V-E-T-O dot pit dot edu slash give U-P-J.